Welcome back to the Real Love Guitars workshop. Stuff to be wiped off the board from yesterday. Um, it's a Saturday and it's a mixed day so far today. Um, Nick came over earlier on and picked up his re-loved re and reinvigorated 12-string Yamaha. Uh, just got an email from him now saying, it is better and easier to play than my new one. So he's taking the new one as reserve tomorrow for his uh, for his playing. Um, I think he plays in a church uh, worship thing. So he's taking his uh, his newer one as the backup, which is very, you know, pleasing. Okay, so here we have John's second guitar. Uh, first one was the um, Epiphone Les Paul standard thing. And this one is the Epiphone Sheraton. And I've had a couple of evenings being able to have a little twang of this. This has got flat wound strings on at the moment, which is quite an odd feeling, but I like it in a funny sort of way, but um, they're really heavy. They feel very heavy and very difficult to bend. So we're going to um, replace those with tens, regular tens, um, but also lower the action and fit a tusk adjustable nut. Now, I'm gonna say it out loud for the next person who comes to my channel and leaves a one line comment that's supposed to show just how amazingly knowledgeable they are. And their comment usually reads something like, this guitar comes with a tusk nut. You don't need to replace it, full stop. Uh, so if I put that person in touch with John, I'd say, John, do you, do you think it, you'd like me to replace the uh, tusk nut on this one as well? And uh, I know for a fact, um, John will say, yes, stick one of your adjustable tusk nuts on there, Sam, because I like the way it stays in tune better than that one does. And I'll tell you why it stays in tune. It's because it's tusk anyway, which is good. That's a new bone one, I think. But the tusk adjustable nut stays in tune because we achieve the ideal first fret action by bringing the nut upwards rather than cutting down into the slots. So we keep the slots factory fresh, unlike a nut like this where you fit it and you usually end up having to cut downwards and that gives you some ragged nut slots. Now it's not the end of the world okay because that's much better than having a bone nut or having a plastic nut okay and it's far better than having a nut where the action first fret action is just simply too high but this gives us the perfect first fret action and it gives us the unmolested factory slots. You can see them there without a human Mm, yeah, file gone anywhere near them. So that's why we do it for. Um, it's because the customer and I both know what the improvement is. And it may seem like a silly thing to you who've bought into the, I don't know what you might call it, the marketing hype from the shop or the manufacturer that says, yay, true new bone tusk, whatever we fitted. And you just tell yourself that that should be absolutely perfect and nothing else needs doing. And that's great. You know, no problem at all. You can, you can believe that if you want. Um, but... I have had many upon many guitars where the um, the new bone or tusk nut that was fitted as a solid one still uh, pinches and grips. And yeah, you can you can widen the slots and you can sort that out. Um, but you know what? If you want to go with a fresh start, you know how good that performs. Then you're going to want one. And coupled with the 3D printed bases that my friend Gerard has made for me. Um, and I'm like a, I'm like a, a crazy dealer here. Look at this, I have baggies of these beauties everywhere. I've got the next couple of years lined up. Now all I have to do is go and buy an absolute ton of um, tusk nut inserts. Anyhow, so look, um, I've just gone and frazzled the main, or I frazzled the, uh, an extension, multiple extender block. It went pop and shut all the, and killed all the um, fuses. So I'm gonna have to run this. I can run it from different ends, but I can't keep track because when the video's on, it doesn't let me see the power. So I'm gonna start running this close-up camera from this end for the time being. But then when I come to do the nut things, I will go to the tether end on battery. And if it conks out, it conks out. And we'll just have to revert back to the overhead or you know the wide angle view sorry about that um so for the time being i'm going to leave it 
attached to over there. So here's the thing. We're going to do a basic, when I say basic, it's the full bifter, but I call it basic because it's what I do every time. We're going to lower the action on this guitar a little bit. We're going to fit an adjustable tusk nut here, remove this one very carefully. We're going to set it all up. We're going to fret level, very careful fret leveling. The frets are good condition. There's plenty of life in them. We're going to level the frets. We're going to clean everything up. We're going to check everything. And then we're going to um, set it all back up with a nice new adjustable nut and regular ordinary, ordinary wound uh, strings. So it's a standard reload guitars setup. In that, that's the only one I do pretty much. Now, having said that, I also have a little thing here. Um, a chap and his uh, teenage daughter came over um, because they found <clears throat> Relove guitars on Google Maps, which is quite cool because um, well, it's, it's annoying in one way because Google Maps only allows me to register as a <clears throat> as a music shop. Um, it does not permit me to kind of say exactly what I do. But anyway, the good plus side of it, of it is that I get some people um, phoning up asking me about um, uh, thing of me, asking me about strings and changing strings and fitting strings and stuff. So that's not a bad thing at all. Because I can uh, can help them out with that, do a little bit of a setup, but also introduce them to what I do beyond that. Um, so anyway, uh, I've got that guitar here, so I'm gonna have uh, an enjoyable light setup, which as I say, is kind of rare for me, but they're, they're local people and they're not, they, they're, it's a, a teenager's sort of first guitar, and um, I don't think she's needing it for a uh, lead guitar. It has some problems, but but they're really interesting problems, actually. One of them is uh, the top E is the most unintonated un string I've ever heard in my life. Anyway, um, but the, what I'm going to do with this first is I'm going to dump these because these are very heavy gauge um, strings. So we're going to dump them and that's the end of them. And they've also got one of those annoying, naughty, naughty little twists in them. Um, which make it quite difficult to get off. Um, yeah, so we'll get rid of these, and we'll, for this case, I'm going to put a set of Toman uh, Harley Benton tens on. Now these, I bought, you know, a few packs of. Uh, oh Christ Almighty! Stabbed again. <sighs> Always the way. Strings with these. Um, yeah. So I bought I bought a set of. Uh, Harley Benton tens for using for this purpose. They're about a pound something each, not a huge amount, but I don't really want to try and do fret leveling with these strings because they're not, they're, I think they're quite a lot, a lot more pull than your typical tens, which we're going to be using. So I really do want to set up with something close. I could dig around, I'm going to have to, this thing's going to bleed for a while now. I could dig around and perhaps find a set of tens, but you know what, for a pound, and for the time involved, I would just rather get this user a set of tomans and get it done than be fiddling around trying to push curled, already curled strings through uh, into, you know, wind, wind them and get them all untangled. It's a bit of a, a hassle, really. Um, earlier on today, I did some more campaigning out in the neighbourhood. Um, you know what I, I really liked about it is just how it just means I get out and meet some people who I otherwise wouldn't have met. Um, so I'm going to leave, leave that on there for now. Yeah, so you know, what, a, what a nice thing to get out and talk to some people I haven't met before, but who are, who are our neighbours um, one way or another. And, you know, lots of different people in different circumstances, some looking, you know, like they really could use some neighbor, neighborhood neighborliness, you know. Um, I mean, you know, we all could, frankly, especially in the end of a pandemic and stuff. So um, and I just I just thought, you know, we need more of this neighborliness than less of it. 
Um, and yet, you know, I sort of, one of the things that's quite clear is that, um, you know, when, when we ask people, have they seen any, have they ever seen the existing parish council people coming round to knock on doors and either introduce themselves or, you know, give people, residents, uh, an up, update of anything? And uh, the answer is no, nobody's ever seen anyone. So that's one of the things that we're, you know, if we get into the parish council, we're certainly going to do our best to change. This thing is bleeding and I've got no plasters. I must get a first aid kit. Um, because otherwise I'm just going to leave lots of little blood stains on my carpet. Oh, that's disgusting. <sighs> Come on, nice, clean, whitey top. I've got some hot water brewing in the other room, so it's a bit like one of those old films. Get some hot water and towels and stuff. There we go. Um, yeah, so that's, I was out doing that a bit, and then I've got about an hour of traipsing about done, and then it gets very, it's been really cold. So it's just been uh, too cold to do it at long stretches. So we, and then it started to rain and sleet and so on. So we decided to, um, hold on. We decided to stop it for the day. And I thought, well, I, what I'll do is I'll actually get this done now these two guitars done this evening get them out of the way and then tomorrow i'll have a, a clear run at campaigning okay so here's the fun and games we're gonna hope to remove this nut without the tragedy of a previous one um that's fine you can just hear that little click and down it goes um it's never simple this this thing it's because they finish, they make the finish go right right up to the uh, the back of the nut. Um, sometimes it can stick really tightly to that. And if it does, you get the risk or run the risk of the, um, the finish wanting to come up as the nut comes off, which is a bit of an absolute pain. So uh, what I'm going to do here, first of all, is I'm going to um, I'm going to just check the fit of this. Um, one of um, Gerard's um, gorgeous little, uh, little bases. Look at that, perfect, just lovely. Um, so that's going to go on there. Now, as you can see, the old Epiphone is always a low slot, so um, I won't really be need be needing to do any downward filing. Filing, yes sanding. Mostly what I'm going to need to be doing for this neck is this nut is sanding, very lightly sanding the edges um, and then uh, just making sure it's flush so it's not a very terrific view. He said reaching for the rather large and cumbersome, there we go, you still see it, cumbersome mirror, mirror. Still my finger bleeding. I might have to, I might have to just uh, Bite the bullet and put on a bit of the old tissue plaster and the, the old green tape. Um, you know, otherwise, I just don't want to run the risk of it everywhere. Not much, but it's just a slightly annoying thing to begin with. So, I've got a nice supply of frog tape. <laughs> And it's, of course, it's impossible to do with one hand. Really? Anyway. So, yeah. So that was the, the campaigning. Come on. You can do it. Come on, tighten, it tighten it up. Yeah, campaigning. Um, so then, yeah, I thought, well, look, if it's going to be rainy, uh, the rest of the day which of course is immediately brightened up <clears throat> but it's got a lot of gray in the air so i thought let's just get the guitar work done and then we can go back to the um go back to the uh, campaigning campaign trail tomorrow on the trail on the stump is that what they called it out on the stump or something you know, politicians so what i'm doing there is i'm just gonna flush 
tidy these back to a flush. We, we just want them to fit into this little uh, width of the nut shelf that's already there. So it's just a very careful matter of um, sanding this flush. Um, maybe about time that I put some, in fact, this is getting a bit dirty, about time I put some new um, paper down so that we can do this quicker and easier. Okay, so that's just about, there you go, we're almost on the mark. That's not bad at all. Um, we're about spot on width wise and by the time this is at the right height we'll be we'll lift that up um, with the, the little keys. Now what what I'm going to just do it's a fraction it's, it's very snug um, so I'm going to take a tiny bit more off this edge so that we sit comfortably. Um, so what I'm what I will do is I'll take these here and the grub screws and I'll just push them through for a minute so we can take the thing out of there. This is how we get it out. Clean it up and we'll put it down so I know which side is which. And then I'm going to come back to here and I'm going to just withdraw the grub screws until they're sort of almost hidden back in there. And I'm going to just keep this thing dead level and I'm going to sand it down. Uh, and the reason for that is I want the feet to be smooth, not pointy. So I don't want to be digging into the, um, the printed base material. I want this to sit on uh, smooth, flat feet. Flat feet. So that's what I've done there. So I'll clean that off again. Get it back in its little unit. We're almost ready to go there. So this, um, this has saved me an absolute ton of hard work which I'm you know I'm so pleased for Gerard has been a, an absolute blessing to help me or to have made these for me because now I can I can glue this in there now um, lift up the uh, lift up the rub screws and then we'll have our task adjustable nut at the perfect height let's just get the camera in position again hello camera I can't quite see what's in picture because I've got this tail end of this thing in the way. Okay, so there's my there's my thing. I think what I'm going to do while I get this leveling and stuff done is I'm going to just try this out, um, lift it up to the point where the strings are where I want them to be in a minute. We'll know by putting on the uh, what's it strings. The, the the word I'm looking for is sacrificial strings. Now this may be fractionally too high. So we've got an interesting sort of challenge here because if this comes out too far, it, it, it has just a slight risk of tipping, well, it won't tip out forward, but it's quite, it's barely in, if you get what I mean. So um, that, that's the challenge of the, the Epiphone slot because they always seem to be deeper than everybody else's for their own reasons, who knows. So anyway, I'm gonna get me 10 gauges I'm going to thread them all up here. Now, I've shown, shown, oh, let's, let's put this, put the strings on loosely because when you use the adjustable nut, when you have an adjustable nut fitted the way I do it, the insert part at the top is loose, so it can come out or it can be sent spinning around your room or the workshop, wherever you are. So when you put the strings on or take them off, you want to do it in a particular way. And the way to make sure when you're removing the strings to make sure that the nut doesn't fly around is to take the sides, start from the sides and move inward. That means that uh, the last two strings on will be the G and the D and they will hold the nut in place. And when you remove them, there won't be any outer strings pressing down to flip the nut off. Um, Similarly, when we string it now, I'm going to start with the D and G first to hold the nut down before I put the other strings on. So I'm just loading them all up to begin with. And that's sort of partly my way of reminding myself to start with the inner strings. Start and end with the inner strings. That's all you need to know. Um, and it doesn't matter if the adjustable nut top does come off because you can just pick it up and carefully fit it back in. Um, as long as it's sitting in its little feet are in its little trough 
base unit, it'll work fine. So like I say, I'm going to go with the G and the D as a beginner. Now I'm going to tune this up um, with these strings. And the first thing I'll do is I'll check and see how this plays um, at a we'll set a low action. And then we'll see how it plays and what, get a sense of what kind of leveling is going to be required. So there's my two middle ones, which I'll deal with first. So the first one is the G. Let's line up all our post holes in the right place. So everything is a little bit easier to work with. So very interesting, the, um, I, didn't, I didn't get their names. They didn't give me their names. So the, the, the local folks who came over, the dad and his daughter, very interesting, um, you know, when you, somebody hands you a guitar and, and describes something wrong with it. Um, and she was sort of saying that um, she thought, they thought there was something wrong with the amp, um, but didn't know. And, and obviously just by listening on the phone, I couldn't, or talking on the phone, I couldn't tell whether if there was something wrong with the output, then it could be partly the guitar or it could be the amp faulty. So we got it across, they brought it over and um, I put it through my amp first and it played, but what I noticed was a, a flubbering farting noise from the uh, low E string. Um, and I think, and not really from any of the others, but it was definitely something odd coming out of the low E or from the low E string. And the, the, what was clear as well, the, the strings were very old. So the first thing I kind of did was um, look at how close the pickups were to the strings and they were extremely close so they took those down out of the way so that they weren't right up wedged up under the under the strings and that improved or reduced the flubbering quite substantially and then after that we sort of got a reasonable sound out of it um, um but it was that that was so that was okay i was thinking right we've, we've got some progress that tells me that's Nothing's majorly broken, but they wanted the strings changing and, um, you know, whatever little low grade, low, you know, low tech setup that I could do, you know, without going the full whole hog with fret leveling. So um, I sort of had a quick look around that it was set to a pretty low action anyway. So, you, you know, it played, it, it sort of played rhythm guitar pretty well everywhere um, it had a already had it's a square affinity and it had a has a tusk nut new bone nut fitted which was surprised me a little bit um, but there's still some definite some room for widening the slots which I'll do um, but I also noticed the first thing I noticed was I played it and it was horrible to play I mean everything seemed out of tune but on the closer inspection it turns out that what was out of tune was the high E and it was it was the most, when I tried to check the intonation, it was nearly a semitone out on the 12th fret, and yet the saddle was in the normal place. Uh, and and I first Im impression was that all, you know, that the bridge was in the wrong place and they were all just terrible. Then I checked all the others one by one, and it turned out that they were, um, they weren't too bad. So the problem was uh, confined to the high E and it was so far out of intonation, you couldn't believe it. And no, no obvious explanation for it. So it was, it struck me that because it was the odd one out and everything else intonated, you know, it was clear that this was a, a dud string that would certainly benefit from being chucked away immediately and that a new string would cure that problem because there's no distance issue that could have caused it. If they were all, um, flat on the 12th fret, then we could have surmised that the bridge was short, uh, sorry, too too long, it was too far from the nut. And very occasionally you find a guitar that's had the bridge put in the wrong place and that's what you get. But So in this case it wasn't, um, so it's just a problem with one string. And like I say, there's no physical um, distance reason to explain why that would be so badly out of intonation, other than the string makeup configuration or string composition itself so that's going in the bin as are all of the other strings they're black with age so i'm going to change them out i'm going to give it a good old clean and um i'm also going to widen the nut slots carefully and lower them a fraction and she's going to get the guitar back playing playing in tune much better than it did but 
still uh, without, she's got it at a very low action, which makes good to play rhythm, um, but she can't get high bends or high E bends without it choking. Um, and I don't think she wants to raise the action and make it harder to play to get those chokes. And I'd actually, you know, play lead guitar notes up there anyway, which is fine. So the compromise, in inverted commas, is going to be the um, you know low action and avoid bending strings at the high on high E right up the top. Um, but I, you know, I was able to explain to her and her dad that if you know if she wanted she got into lead guitar playing, then you know fret leveling would be the only way. Either fret leveling or raising the playing action are the only ways to um, you know regain those bends. Okay, so the first thing, as always, um, let's just get it up to pitch a minute. Okay, so what this is showing me straight away is that um, this shelf is quite low. And, and in this case, we, no, I don't know though. Let's have a look. I think we'll get away with it. I was gonna say we might need, we might need, uh, no, we can do it, it works. I say we might have needed to um, shim or, or find a bigger nut base, but actually uh, this, this works. Okay, so next thing we're going to do is we're going to check the neck relief and we're going to check the um, last fret action. So I'm just going to try and get a reasonable view. Not the best, but it's difficult to keep an eye on it. So let's look. We've got um, about 0.2. It's not bad. And as the final last fret action goes, we've got a little bit higher than I'd want it. I would say that was verging on 2.5. Well, it's 2.25, I'd say. So it's too high. Now, what will happen, I'm sure, is as we dial this down in, it's very stiff. So we dial it down in, um, we'll probably find that the fret slap increases quite a bit. Let's check on the treble sign. 1.5 on the treble side. Again, let's try it down a little bit. Being a sort of Les Paul style configuration in neck construction, we should be able to get it to a 1.5. Yeah, it's a tad over 1.5. Leave it there. And that's about 1.2, maybe a fraction, maybe 1.1. So we'll just take it to there. So I'm going to do a little bit, a little bit more stretching. These Harley Benton strings don't tolerate as much stretching as any ball type things. The, the wound on bit at the end is a little bit prone to unwinding in my experience, but um, oh, maybe once in a while more than the regular ones. I'm not going to spend a lot of time bending, stretching. Mm. Because we're not keeping these strings on in the end anyhow. So this is really about what happens to the individual notes. So here we go. Oh, 
that. isn't too bad but there are some high notes more uh, uneven frets in this case than um, fret slap which is a little bit unusual it's usually the fret slap that kicks in so choking out on the 12 in the G track So let's just <laughs> there you go. What did I tell you? Did I say to you, or did I not say to you, that Harley Benton strings come un undone when you stretch them too hard? That's not good, is it? Come on, Harley Benton. Come on, that's, that's, you know, that's costing me money. That's not good. All I'm doing is bending them. No more or no less than a player might bend them. Come on, that's not good. Now I've got to find a high E from somewhere that I can continue my fret leveling job with. Boo, hiss. Well, at least, uh, at least my, you know, when I said that about the uh, high E, I was feeling a bit rotten, thinking, oh, maybe I've just been a bit unkind to Harley Benton, you know, and if anyone ever watched it from Harley Benton, they'd be going, oh, that's not fair on our quality strings. But you know something, Harley Benton, I didn't make it up, did I? And that just actually just did actually happen right there and then. Now, the question is, am I ever going to be able to extract this one from the crowd? I am. Thankfully, I left the set more or less extractable, but now they're useless because I've now used up the remaining uh, the e high E, which is now makes this set <sighs> useless, really. Not good to anybody, but anyway, I got out of jail on that occasion. But it's likely to do the same. So we've got a tiny bit of high E choke out, but it's, it's not the end of the world. But I think, and there's a bit of uh, high fretting down the bottom, which is causing a bit of dead, deadish notes. So I think we will give it its its careful leveling, um, and we'll check as we go. Providing these Hardy Benson strings don't just die on me again before I get to actually check whether the bends work or not. It's funny, isn't it? Some, why, why a cheaper string should not get that bit right. I mean, to be fair, you know, you could probably play it all day long with a very a light hand, but, you know, I wasn't really bending that much more. Uh, you know, a good guitarist, well, not a good guitarist, but a good guitarist might, you know, bend it, give it some welly while playing it. And that just unwound itself off the ball there. As I said, it would. Okay, so what I'm going to now do is I'm going to now mark up the frets. Just checking everything else as we go. As I say, I've played this at home, so it's um, as far as playing goes, it's good. Everything's playing well. It sounds nice. Um, I have to say, as with many Epiphones, I get this thing that I like this guitar, and you know, it's a lovely shape, and it's a quality-made guitar, and it's very 60s. And you know, when you when you pick it up, and you just want to go up on top of the Apple Building or whatever it was, and you know, play play um you know the decker rooftop set or whatever it was the beatles played it just feels like that kind of guitar 
Um, but I would say that I feel there's not a great distinction between the, the two pickups in tone. And that's just me. I'm not an expert in this. So, you know, right. Please dismiss my take on it. But maybe, you know, if, if you if you had a similar sort of experience with it or thought similar thought, my, my sort of preference would be that that as a combination of the way the pickups made and I don't know enough about it to know how you would make that difference but let's say as a combination of both the way the pickups made and where it's placed i.e bridge or neck I, I would like my two pickups bridge and neck to be substantially different so that when you put the combination on the third tone is also very different from either of them um, you know so that, so that all three positions have a distinct flavor to them you know and in, in some ways that's what's really nice about a strat that has good quality pickups is you get a really rich set of tones you know the three positions and the in-betweens and there's something distinctive about them that makes it really satisfying not if you've got anonymous sort of um, pickups it just doesn't seem to do it but you know if you've got decent quality then it really really seems to work so unfortunately for me, the Epiphones have quite often felt um, nice, but, but just a little limited in difference, so that I probably wouldn't go much out of the middle position or, you know, much out of the neck, the middle, because the neck and the middle don't feel that much different or sound that much different to me. But hey, listen, I am not no expert, nor likely to be. So here we go. Let's go. Whoops. Let's put this back on. Let's get stuck into calibrating the U-channel truss rod for this pipe ice. Um, this was used yesterday on um, on the 12th string, next 12th string with the Evo Gold fret. So I was just brushing some Evo Gold dust off there. Gold dust. I mean, wow, this guitar here would look fab with some Evo Gold frets on. You know what I mean? It really would. So this is quite a flat neck, so we've not got a lot of curve anywhere or anything. So that will do to kick off. Um, gently take that off. Used to put some tape under here, but you know, one of the things that struck me is when you, as soon as you take this off a nut, it slacks off and there's no tension touching the thing. So I was kind of, mm, I don't know what the word would be. I was a bit sort of waylaid by somebody's excessive concern you know and I think they expressed it in a sort of good wouldn't let you touch my guitar sort of way um, and I said oh I better cover those things up then and actually you know since I've, I've rediscovered what I knew from the outset anyway which is oh yeah it's it's not under tension when it goes off the edge there it's now released from, you know there's no tension so it's not in any danger of harming the finish that's more likely to do it okay so looking at the um way that this is working on the fret tops here um where there's a couple of high frets here which is what we know that that bend out there was a little bit um on the fret and although that's not where it chokes because that's the edge um we'll probably find that it's still a little bit high as we go across into the middle into the g track as i would call it um now we're going to check the individual notes. That's very good. Now we'll just use the same calibration for the uh, B track and um, push this off to one side if we can. Hmm. Okay, if we can't, we, it's not the end of the world. We've still got room. We can just pull it to one side while I'm doing it. Interesting. There's what looks to be a couple of low frets showing themselves out at this point. Um, and I would say it's these two here um, and one here. So there's three low frets on this thing, possibly four. So that means that's why I was getting a bit of a bit of a ch not a choke, but a little bit of an unclear note down here, just playing it because fretting in that little dip 
causes it to a little tiny frizzle. It's improved. Tiny bit more to go. So yeah, a low fret. Um, there's always this curious thing, a low fret is as big a problem as a high fret because it's just simply because a low fret makes the adjacent fret effectively high and makes it behave high as if it's high with the you know accompanying problems of a high fret so the kind of the relative height of the frets don't really care whether one's high or low it just cares about the combined aggregate effect and so a low fret makes the next one high and you have to it's actually harder to deal with in a way than the single high fret because a low fret requires that you bottom out all the frets around it to its level. Um, so it's a, it's a single low fret actually ends up being a little bit costly in terms of um, fret metal compared to a single high fret, which is much easier to take down um, because it's just sticking up above the rest. So it kind of, in a way, you're you're more on the alert for low frets. Now, you know, the, the problem with a low fret is you think to yourself, well, you know, how much fret metal do I waste, in inverted commas, bottoming out the low fret um, before I do something like pull it out and replace it with a higher fret or better, or, you know, replace it with one that's pressed in only as much as the others, but no more, um, because you have to sort of figure out why it's, a low fret um, why it's behaving as a low fret is it because it's been hammered in too hard uh, it can be the case because wood is soft and if you hammer the fret hard you will make it you will force it into the wood in a way that's just low enough to um you know have an impact on it so that it plays or it acts as low relative to the others Okay, that's good. Do you see that? Chokes have gone. Only a tiny amount needed to do it, thankfully, but you know, that's then cleared up. Uh, yeah, so you, the question is, you know, when you're faced with a, a low fret, do you remove it, try and put another one in that you hope is A, the same size, B, you, you hope you're gonna tap it in only as hard as you did the previous one, and how hard was that? Do you know, can you measure it? Is it organic? Is it you know, carefree, sort of free and So it's very difficult to know. Um, and actually in my experience so far, I've always reserved that option in case, you know, I couldn't get it to play, you know, in case that there was the low fret really, really did impose itself on the whole playability. Um, but in truth, I've never, it's never actually been so low that that was required. And, you know, the, the associated hassles that would come with that because, you know, even if I could find a close approximate gauge of frets, um, I'd have to pick a different gauge from the original because remember the originals are pretty worn. So I'd have to get a, a, a gauge that's close to where, where they are now and hope it matched and hope I put it in right um, and so on and so on. Anyway, it, so in truth, it works out that I've never had, it's never made sense to replace the fret yet. And I don't actually think it will. I think it will we'll just carry on, you know, when we get a low fret. The, the clearances are so tiny that it, although it takes metal material off the other frets to bottom out a low fret, there is no way around it really, if you want to have the low action without chokes and buzzes. Um, and it's far less destructive than you initially fear it's going to be. And by the time you've got it, all that you're left with is a really nice level set of frets when strung and when loaded. Uh, and it plays great and you forget that one was ever low because you can't see any evidence of it. Um, you know, and the, the precision of this method, which, you know, can seem like just a discussion for nerds in many ways. But what I like about this method is because it, what I've learned over the years is that because it levels with the neck under tension, and it's the only 
I mean, you know, there are, there are one or two tools that do this, but you know, it, it's so much better than the original method. These are low frets down here, by the way. Um, it's better than the sort of conventional method that lots of us learned on, you know, where you get a, you set the neck flat and you get a, a beam and you just run it up and down. And, you know, until you've got no more clicks on your uh, fret rocker. Not bad at all. I'm going to do a fraction more just to be sure. Um, yeah, so it's, it's uh, the, the conventional method, inverted commas, um, it doesn't level. When you're leveling in that method, you're not leveling with the compression, longitudinal compression of the neck at play. And that, for whatever reasons, it turns out that when you compress the neck this way, not just curve it, but when you squeeze it from end to end, which is what only happens when you've got strings on, it doesn't happen it doesn't happen when you bend the neck, like on a jig or anything, it has to be both bent and compressed, and ideally compressed by, or bent by compression. Um, then what happens is when you level it this way, uh, you've leveled it with all the strange little quirky hillocks and valleys uh, of the neck under compression, at, you know, in in your at play in your in your in the act of leveling. So you've leveled it with all of that at play, and that makes a it makes a much more level or better leveling. And also, unlike the other method, then when you take the strings off, clean everything up, polish everything out, put the strings back on, it reverts right back to the compressed um, situation that you had before, and. It goes straight back to the perfectly level uh, state of affairs. And um, by comparison, the neck that you uh, took strings off and leveled while it was flat, you get it flat like that. And as soon as you put the strings on, it not only bends it, which is OK, but it compresses it and some of the little, little uh, crinkles in the neck come back. Now, hark how, hark how cleanly the tuners work, thanks to this nut. Not a hint of a ping or drag or anything. That's why anonymous critic Beautiful. That is why I do what I do and change the nut that you think is a perfect nut for a Tusk Custom Adjustable, because I know how much of an improvement it makes. And I'm going to keep on doing that so long as I know how much of an approve, improvement it makes. It's hard to say those kind of things without verging on being an American. How big of a difference, how much of a difference it makes. But you know what I mean. It's it's absolutely worth doing and I wouldn't bother if it wasn't I'm not you know, I love how, I love how some critics assume that you're just doing it because you as if you've never thought about it and you just did it because oh, I don't know I read it somewhere I've never done anything well that's not true I've done it when I was nervous and young and foolish and, oh, when I was new to the game there were one or two things I did uh, because everyone said you did them that way and I just couldn't face the the, the screams, you know, the criticisms and the slag offs in the comments if I didn't do it that way. And then eventually I worked out that they were, they were wrong, those ways that suggested, you know, that, that it was just pointless. So I stopped doing it just because everybody expected it. And I only did it um, if there was a damn good theoretical reason for it. Okay, so what I'm going to do now while we're still running, um, I don't know how the battery is. I'm going to, we've got basically, while chatting away, um, we've got ourselves a really perfectly level set of frets for a 10 gauge strings on this guitar in these kind of conditions. Now, one of the things I've been very, very keen to stress every time now, it used to be, I guess in, in the days of um, guitar techs, you know, the guitar tech would really probably prefer you 
to leave them do everything. So they, it would be in the guitar tech's interest maybe to have you think, oh, well, I can't do anything, so I'll only bring it to the guitar tech. Um, what, what I've realized is very true and necessary is that um, your guitar, I, I'll set it up now and I'll do the fret leveling work, which is, which is important and precise fastidious and precise <laughs> um i knew that sounded familiar fastidious and precise uh but your guitar neck will change around throughout the year very likely to change and i i implore you to learn how to adjust your truss rod um so you're not afraid of doing it i saw somebody posting on a forum the other day on facebook um Oh, maybe it was what's that Quora thing where people ask questions. I think I listed myself as once upon a time as you know, ask me questions about guitar setups or something like that. And uh, so I get sort of these notifications that somebody's asking about such and such. And uh, I think I saw somebody make a comment like, you know, be very, very, very careful of doing an adjustment with your truss rod. You can absolutely ruin your guitar that way. And he was absolutely unequivocal about it and i just thought hmm, that doesn't that's just not my experience so i wrote a little message saying um you know i'm interested you know I, I, it's not been my experience and I, I i had to really stop myself and rethink it so i didn't come across as uh i don't know really ridiculing him or you know cleverer than thou whatever uh, righteous or something so you know i had to i had to really come from that well maybe i'm wrong maybe maybe somebody's had that experience where it's trashed their precious gibson and maybe i just haven't had it happen so maybe i need to ask somebody to share their experience that makes them you know and i was very proud of myself for having <laughs> you know restrained my ridicule um, and asked a question a genuine question instead you know with a genuine intention of learning something if i you know, if, if somebody else had had a different experience. So I put the question out there, you know, very, you know, saying that's, that's honestly not my experience of it, but I'm really keen to know, you know, have you, have you been in a situation where that's happened? Um, and I didn't get any reply to it at all. It could be because the person is incredibly busy fixing broken truss rods. Um, or it could be actually they just believe it and there isn't any evidence to back it up. Um, I don't know which of the two it is, but it's it wouldn't surprise me if it was the latter, um, you know, because the truss rod is designed to be used to control the neck curvature. End of story. You know, and I I grow weary of this world. When are we to return to Transylvania? Uh, I grow weary of saying to people who say, you know, give advice on a forum, they'll go, somebody say, oh, I don't like the playing action on my my Epiphone Sheraton. And that person will say, ah, well, you've got to adjust your truss rod. And that will, that will, you know, that's, that's how you adjust your action. Give it a couple of tweaks. And, uh, and I'll sort of go and say, actually, whilst it's true that a change in the guitar's playing action in the middle of the neck is characteristic or is a is a byproduct or a result side effect if you like of um slackening your truss rod uh it isn't the primary reason or method by which you would um adjust your guitar's playing action you would do that by adjusting the what I call the last fret action, or the bridge height, and the first fret action, the, the slots, depth of the slots. Um, those are where you adjust your guitar's playing action. And of course, the neck relief, more or less neck relief, has a, a, an impact on that, but it's not the primary. And the reason it's not the primary means to do it is because it's not even even, or not even even, it's not even even the way across the neck it's it's pronounced in the middle no it's not it's more pronounced how do you pronounce it it's more pronounced in the middle um because that's how it works so it's i think good to think of get your head around the fact that the truss rods one and only function really is to adjust 
it's, it's, well, it's to counter the curvature of the neck imposed by the strings. Usually that's, that's what usually wants to bend the neck. So the truss rod counters that and allows you to control it and add more or less curvature, permit more or less curvature. And modern, more modern truss rods allow you to um, actively dial in more or less uh, curvature or, you know, in either direction. So it used to be in the old days that the only thing that would put a curve or relief, relief curve in your neck was the actual force of the strings and that the truss rod uh, could, its only function really was to counteract that desire of the strings to cause your neck to bend in a concave fashion. Um, and, and as a result of that, uh, if, your, if your neck, um, if when you slackened your truss rod right off, if the strings were, let's say, so light that they didn't pull enough of a curve into your neck and your neck remained flat or will be tied even a little back bowed, then in the older truss rods, there was nothing you could do about it. You, you, only, you could only, option was to put on heavier gauge strings and hope or in some very extreme cases, you could, um, and some arch top guitars I've had in the past where there was no truss rod at all, um, you ended up after 50 years of it bending slowly into a fixed position, you end up, um, uh, what's the word, planing, planing off the curve or sanding the curve right off it and starting again. Now, that's a bit extreme, but you know, the, the, the modern, the more modern truss rod um, works in both works positively in both directions so uh, it, yes it allows the strings to pull but even if there isn't enough string uh, force to pull your neck into a curve um, continuing to turn the truss rod counterclockwise continues to or actively forces the neck into a, a concave curve relief curve so that's um it's a modern thing, but it's, you know, its primary purpose is to control the curvature of your neck. And then you come back to the basic question then, um, why do I need or don't need curvature in my neck? What's what's all that about? And that's a really simple and un, 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 unsexy answer, really. And that is, if you have, your, your strings need some room to spin, because that's how they work. Um, and different gauges and different tensions spin in different ways. Um, and you have to provide them enough room for them to spin. And you do that either by having the action set quite high at the saddle, in which case there's loads of room you know, by the law of triangles, if you think about it. Um, a high bridge action will create a lot of space um, and that allows the strings to move in that space. But if, uh, if both the nut action and the bridge action are set really low, then the only place, if they're, if they're really low, the only place really you can make some space for the strings to, um, to move around as they need to is by dialing in, in some, a, a greater curve. Um, and that only, well, that creates some room in the middle of the neck, roughly, um, where the truss rod has its maximum impact. Right, now these now don't have a nine, sorry, I don't have a, yeah, don't have a top string, so I'll bin those, because they're no good, they're incomplete set. That's now the complete set. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, so, and if you, if you, if the kind of person who really wants a low action uh, and a flat neck, um, then the fact is you are not giving your strings much room to spin period, end of discussion. There's no there's no ways around it. Um, that means that if you hit them fairly hard, you can almost be certain that you're going to get a uh, fret slap because there's just not enough room for the strings to move. Um, if you don't hit them very hard at all, then you can probably get away with playing with a much lower action and flatter neck. Um, but the, you know, the three things are clear interlinked uh, and you have to play them off against each other that's all that's all you can do you, there's no magic there's no mystery about it it's just it's a it's a matter of space um, and room for things to move and if you don't make the space for them they can't move they'll hit the frets and i call that fret slap 
and it'll just be a horrible noise. So, um, you know, you've got th you've got a, a variety of things to play with. You've got a variable of how hard you hit the strings. You've got a variable of the types of strings that you fit, the gauge, how stiff they are to get them up to tension. You've also got a variable of the um, scale length of the guitar, which makes certain uh, it makes it um, makes one set of or a particular gauge of strings reach pitch without having as much tension, which means they flop around more. So on a shorter scale, the strings will move. You'll need more space, even for the same kind of light playing style, um, as wouldn't need so much space on a Les Paul or a Strat and so on and so on. Um, and then on top of that, you've got the variable that is your, uh, your bridge action, and you've got the variable of your first fret action, and you've got the variable of how much curvature you've dialed into the neck. So all of those things are inter interrelated. And you have to just know that the bottom line is the strings need room to move, otherwise nothing works. Um, and you can't have your cake and eat it, whether you like to or not. Something has to give, um, and the optimum is there's room for the strings to move, uh, in, you know, along with how you play or in accordance with the way you strike them. And that's going to be different for everybody. So you can see straight away that me setting up a guitar for one player um, is a... Is a is a pretty, um, I'm going for a sort of guesstimate for, you know, as low as possible with a reasonable amount of force hitting. Um, but sometimes it is the case that I set up a nice low action with as little uh, neck relief as is reasonable or feasible. Um, and there are occasions where I can see uh, a, a player or a customer gets the guitar back and that when they, they say, oh, I've got some buzz, and then they can send me a video sometimes, and I can see that their, their way of playing it can be much um, heavier than I might play it. And as a result, there isn't enough room for the strings to move, and we have to create some more space, and that, you know, that's just, there's, there's no way around it. I think one of the most important things about recognizing or understanding the relationship of all those variables is that if you don't understand it, you run a risk of thinking you can level your way out of not enough string movement room. So when, for example, if you've chosen a combination of too flat a neck plus too low an action, um, some people might think that I haven't le leveled it enough, which is why it's buzzing. And actually, um, the, I've leveled it as much as will have any effect. You know, if you hit it at a certain strength and we have a combination of, you know, let's say very springy strings, short scale, low action, it's all those all those things con combining to mean that the strings don't have enough room to move adequately, then at that stage, there's no more, fret leveling is a, a diminishing returns. You won't get any more, a better playing out of leveling it, it just becomes a waste of fret metal because there's a there is a physical limit um because you're you're just taking I mean, eventually it'll work because the more more space you create with your frets eventually it will provide that will be fret leveling eventually it will provide that little bit of extra space that's missing but you know it's a costly way to grind away the life of your frets um just because you haven't accepted the basic constraints or that there are basic constraints beyond which you can't hope to go. Um, so it's a, it sounds like a really complicated thing, but it's a common sense thing. Um, and I'm, I'm increasingly trying to get people to understand that while I can set it up for this sort of climate today for an average player, possibly a bit like me, I'm very average, um, you know, I'm setting up a fairly low action but of course with the adjustable nut one that you can change if you find that it doesn't still doesn't leave enough room for your climate your strength of hitting um, and so on your type of strings that you chose this week or whatever so um, but but a key thing in that to make necessary adjustments is to not be afraid of the truss rod um, so it really 
slightly infuriates me when somebody goes onto a forum and declares with absolute authority uh, that you know you'll destroy your guitar if you or you run the risk of ruining your guitar. Now some people, you know, they spend a thousand quid on the guitar and they're going to back off and avoid doing it because you know they they think oh, I can't afford to take this chance and then they might bring it to someone like me and spend money and then re regret spending money because part of them feels like I, mean, I should be able to do this myself and they're quite right you should not because it isn't good to have me to do it but because throughout the year the humidity will change and the clearances are so tiny that my perfect setup today in six months time may find because the clearances are so small you may find the neck has flattened out a tiny bit more than it was today and as a result of those tiny clearance, clearances we're working with anyway you may find that uh, that results in a little bit of buzzing um, and you can either kind of panic about that and it's ruined the guitar or if you have a little bit of practice beforehand before that moment in adjusting your own truss rod then you won't be caught out by it and it won't be a disaster because you, you will know that the only thing that's likely to have changed will be the truss rod either flattening a bit or cur um, curving a bit more. Ah, damn it, I'm stuck. This is really annoying. I'm stuck between sizes of tape because I can't find my usual tape. So I'm going to have to hang this up and cut some more bits. Um, yeah, anyway, so, so I really, really, really do encourage everybody to get experience adjusting their truss rods so that if you, you were to say to me six months later, six months from now, um, you know, hey, you certainly did that setup for me. Um, but since then, or well, in the last few weeks, I've noticed that. Uh, and if you said to me, it was lovely to play in the first few months, but then it seems to have crept, the buzz has crept in somewhere in the, I don't know, say in the middle of the, of the fretboard. Um, well, if I could then say to you, sounds, like almost certainly like your neck is um, flattening out due to you know, the change in the weather. So I recommend you get the truss rod adjuster, get the hex key, sorry, and uh, um, just slack, slacken the, uh, I'll just find the right size bits of tape here, slacken the, um, the adjuster off to allow a little bit more relief into the neck via the strings or via the adjuster itself and that way you give it back a tiny bit of curvature to suit the season which is perhaps dried out a little bit or it's not raining for six months or whatever um, and then you will be up and playing again in, in a few seconds so i think it's critical that you do you know and i'm very happy that people send me the guitars for this sort of work because you know, it's time and precision that you might not have. But I think you really, you really all should make it a priority to become from, you know, competent and comfortable making adjustments to the truss rod. And the best way to do that, as I've said a billion times before, ad nauseum, I think is about the correct term here. The best way to do that is to have some, you know, get your strung guitar, uh, get the truss rod cover off, feel how it plays normally and then crank to one extreme in one direction, turn it fairly uh, you know, robustly until you can feel, for example, if you turn it um, counterclockwise, turn it until the, it's clearly an action gap that opens up in the middle of the neck and, and it's, you can feel how big it is and then feel what it's like to play it. Um, you know, you've created loads more room but it will have an impact on, on the way it feels to play. You know, and people describe it as, you know, it feels like the action is really high. Well, that's because at that point in the center of the neck, it, it is. Um, and then, you know, go back to uh, the midpoint again, see what that's like um, by comparison again, and then go right back to, uh, go right the other way um, and go, go and turn it until it's convex. Right, it literally deliberately put some back bow into the neck and watch it turn into a convex hump um, and then see what that does to how it plays and you know do it a little bit by a little bit and then as I say you know 
get familiar with exactly what starts to change and how and how that relates to playing because as soon as you get some direct experience of that you'll be able to diagnose immediately what's happening if the weather changes or the climate yeah whoops climate changes you know something changes and your neck starts to change shape having tried it out before you'll you'll be in a great position just to spot it and go ah okay that's uh, we've got too much you know back bow it's it's now no longer not even flat it's not curved no relief it's not even flat it's now gone back bowed which means i can't i literally won't be able to play any of the notes probably in the first half or if i do they're buzzing and choking in the first half of the of the neck so you know when you get to understand that you'll just be able to fix that immediately <clears throat> and you won't waste time and money bringing it along to someone like me not not that it's not nice to do your work i love it as you know but i do want you to be confident to do that stuff for the rest of the time so you don't feel you have to come and throw money at people like me to do what you could spot yourselves anyway that's my plea um and you know i'm the kind of person if somebody insists or makes a sort of strong statement that twisting or adjusting your truss rod can damage your guitar i had to go and try it out so i tried to break a neck by adjusting the truss rod as it happened the truss rod was um seized but i couldn't i couldn't unseize it and i couldn't break it and i couldn't do any harm to anything so it was a it was a no-go right so i'm going to put oh shit. i'm going to plug this in a minute um, but actually i'm going to stop and get a cup of tea and i think i'm going to phone jt for a chat uh long overdue and then i shall come back for this um polish out but i think what i'll do is i'm going to clean the whole of this guitar uh i'll do the fret leveling sorry the i'll do the fret polishing in a minute off camera uh, and I'll then go into a cleaning process and then um, once that, that's done, um, we'll come back ready to put the new strings on and string it up and stretch the strings. See you in a bit. Okay, here we are, polished up, cleaned up, everything ready to go back on and fresh strings. And we're going some nice whoa, Ernie Ball 10s. So let's get everything back on. Now, of course, I've moved the action on the bridge. So we're going to need to reset it in a minute. That's fine. I'll just put it back where we want it. And we can do because the great thing about this action is that it's, oh, that's typical, isn't it? Yet another one where the bridge posts are not in the right place quite. It's very, very fine so you have to loosen the posts off to get it on get it on and then it tightens up as we god blimey yeah now this this is kind of dodgy because you can dial it down but you have to be very careful because it's liable to slip because it's too tight because yes it's the wrong spacing well it's just very slightly wrong and it doesn't give you any wiggle room so it then tightens up and the risk of damaging it increases right now i'm going to use a bit of this cloth here to put oil on the fingerboard so we've done the precision fret leveling done the polishing out recrowning sorry and then the polishing out um, cleaned everything checked everything tuners off um, clean the headstock tuners back on I've checked everything in the progress process. Um, so now we're going to put some tens on, stretch them out, and we'll be done. And uh, I think this will be a lovely low action again. Okay, I can go in the bin. I think that can go in the bin too. A couple of worn out. Right, let's get some to tens. Regular stinky tens. Ernie Bow. I've got a Zoom meeting in about 25 minutes, something like that. So this is working out 
perfectly timedly. So, 46. So, um, I'm going to put all these through the stop bar first. And then we'll remember we'll fix the middle two first so that it holds the nut on. Um, and then we'll just, once we've got it all secure, we'll then uh, adjust the bridge playing action or the, the bridge action. It's a lovely guitar, this. Made me want a semi acoustic, and I'm sort of, you know, I could be tempted with a 339 or a 335 like this. I don't know, they call this a 335? It's a Sheraton. Whatever they call it, it's a 335 shape in my book. Um, so, yeah. In the in between time, I just had a, a Facebook chat with um, JT, and uh, while I was having that chat, I was also doing a sort of quick setup for the young lady who came over with her dad. Um, and that action on that guitar is now super duper low and light, um, but it still has the slight choking out on the high frets, but there's now we can do about that. That's how it's going to be. That's the way it's going to be. So we're going to do the G and the D first, the usual routine. Um, I'm just hoping to goodness that the good old fashioned intonation is going to be good. Mm -hmm. I'll switch camera views in a minute. Go under there, please. Thank you. about the fender style headstocks is when they're all on the same side it makes doing this part much easier as you can probably see okay not in place safely anchored Yeah, I kind of, um, I'd like to build one of these, um, but I'm not really, I don't think I've got the time or the patience at the moment to do, try and make, you know, a shaped top, of, you know, it's a bit beyond me, woodworky wise. So, but I'd like to make a kit version, that'd be great. Uh, it's just a matter of, I suppose, finding a decent quality kit. Um, I mean, they all end up coming from China, unless you're paying a lot of money, in which case you can probably get American. Uh, although there are a few more UK based um, builders at the moment. I think the Luthiers Warehouse, I can't remember exactly where they are, up north somewhere. I think they're um, starting to make more kits, bodies and neck kits. So that would be good. The 335 or 339 kit would be much appreciated. Okay, one more and we're all aboard. And then we'll be into stretching, intonating, and we're probably there. Thank you. Up 
you come. Lovely job, me. Every few weeks, I take my um, take all my rubbish down to the tip and bags a whole sort of uh, bag of I don't know um, you know guitar string packages cut off guitar strings all that a load of load of good stuff okay now I'm gonna just pull these stress them tighten them a little bit to get them seated nice and firmly bit big to get your arm over on the bench, especially when the bench is tall, like this one deliberately is. <laughs> Sit tight, I tell you. Boing, boing. Too low. Let's bring this up a bit. Let us check. Let us check the end. <laughs> Master fret action. Our black guitars always, always get, get dusty immediately. Just over two. No, sorry, just over 1.5. That's 1.5. That's 1.5 too. As well, I mean. 1.5, 1 1.5, 1 1.2. Doing, doing. So we're going to start some stretching shortly. I can see the hope burning in my eyes that this this uh, tunematic bridge will, in fact, intonate properly. Stretching along here. And here. Okay, it's all going all right so far. Fingers crossed. Knowing John's guitars, it will be correctly intonated, so I don't need to worry. That's my theory.
Bring in tune. Beautiful. Like it, like it. Okay, let's do the, the last little bit. And we can call this Saturday night to an end. This thrilling Saturday night. I haven't got a b -b -b bag for this thing, so I'm going to have to wrap it back up in the bubble wrap, what I brought it up here in. Um, that's the way it's going to go. Please, Mr. Tunamatic Bridge, do me the honour of working first time. Don't make me have to take you apart, or else I will be very uh, upset. Good. Don't, don't, no, no, don't do it to me, you, you, you Bertie Dastard. How must I hate the Junomatic Bridge that's demanding that I take it apart? Once again, I'm at the limits of how far it can possibly go. If this doesn't work, I'll kill it. I certainly will. Thank God. Thank heavens above that, that, my dear, my dear Mr. Whatever you're called, Chuno Matic, whoever invented this piece of yuck. Looky, looky, look how close to running out of room we are. Let's zoom in just for the sheer joy of it. Look, we're slap bang up against the back wall. Where are we? Yeah, look, all right up, crunched up against the back wall, just intonated. within millimeters of having to come back and do that bit again. Why, I sure do dislike you, Mr. Tunomatic. <laughs> that would be, that would be putting it mildly, I have to say. Right, on with the, on with the thing. Well, what's it telling me about the time? It's saying you were half an hour from your meeting now. Now you're half an hour from a Zoom meeting. I could actually rush back home and do it from home. I don't think I was very successful in getting a video call going from here earlier on, but anyhow. So there we are. The Epiphone Sheraton set up, fret leveled, um, new adjustable tusk nut with a decomatic uh, Gerard, Gerardized adjustable nut, um, and uh, Pice clay, low as anything. I think um, I think John will be happy with this because 
he was hoping it would be somewhere as low as the Epiphone. And actually, no, as the original first guitar he sent me, which was the Epiphone standard, Les Paul standard. And actually that is as low and beautifully light. So fab, right. Okay, with all of that done and dusted, I thank you for watching. Thanks for spending Saturday night with me. I'll see you again soon. That's it for today. Have a great bank holiday. Uh, you won't see us until after all that's done and gone, but I hope you had a great bank holiday. And I'll see you sometime in next week with some more guitars.